Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Kare. I am the convener on this session. Uh, Dr. Bawa, my very close friend and colleague, is uh, the co-convener on the session. And uh, uh, Dr. Pramod Gandhi and Dr. Ma Nitin Matre, they both practicing in Panvel. They are primarily trauma surgeons and they have kindly consented to be the chairperson on this uh, uh, on this uh, afternoon 45-minute uh, session. Uh, there are six presentations and uh, there's one speaker missing, but I think he's uploaded his presentation. So we'll be uh, carrying on because the first five speakers are here. So there are a few interesting mix of uh, topics like muscular technique, uh, periprostatic fractures, uh, decision to graft after fixation of fractures, percutaneous iliosacral screw fixation, and bridge plating, uh, or a need for second plate and bone graft, etc., and some augmentation failures by the last speaker. So without much ado, I am going to uh, call upon the first speaker, that is my co-convener, Dr. Bawa, to kindly take the dice. He is going to speak on masculine techniques, useful or uh, farce. So let us uh, learn more from him. Thank you, Dr. Kale. Good afternoon, everybody. I am going to speak about masculine technique, whether it is useful or farce. First, let us see what is masculine technique. Masculine in 1986 came out for treatment of infective gap nonunions. The gap was created basically due to trauma, resection of tumor, infected tissues, or itogenic. So he introduced a two-stage approach. Basically, it was called an induced membrane technique for reconstructing segmental bone defects with infection. So what is induced membrane technique? In stage one, there is debridement, remove the dead devitalized tissues, and curate the bone till the bleeding edges. At the same time, send the uh, specimen for culture sensitivity and then add cement spacer. This cement spacer which was added which was without antibiotics and apply fixator. Masculine preferred a external fixator to be applied, primary stabilization. After six to eight weeks, when there is like uh, no signs of infection clinically as well as inflammatory markers are within normal range, he advised to go ahead with a second stage, that is incise the induced membrane which is formed, remove the spacer and put cancellous bone graft. He only advised cancellous bone graft for his technique. Okay. At the same time, you do internal fixation and soft tissue reconstructive procedure as and when required. Induced membrane basically it was a foreign body type of inflammatory reaction which was rich in growth factors. This induced membrane basically is a highly vascular acts as a barrier, prevent cancellous bone resorption, it causes consolidation of bone graft and preserves and protects anastomotic flap pedicles. What are the size of defect? According to Maskele, there is no limit to the size of defect. He advised that at least up to 25 20 centimeters have been treated successfully. What was the time of union? According to him, it was like union was 7.5 months post second stage. So what were the issues or concerns? Basically, large amount of uh, cancellous graft was required for big defects and there was resorption of the graft. Of course, it affected the mechanical properties being a cancellous graft and leads to failure because of infection also. And there was increased number of interventions almost in the mean range of around 6.2. So what were the contentious issues the problem was and how much we have tried to correct it, let us see whether to add antibiotics in cement spacer, what were the timings for the second stage, and bone graft. The timing for the second stage is actually surgeon concern. So important factors being antibiotics and the bone graft. So let us see one by one, antibiotics. According to Maskele, he didn't add antibiotics to the cement spacer. The reason being, it masks the acute infection or it may be inactive on the germs, so may increase the biological resistance. Also, it may affect the characteristic of membrane and the absence of recurrent infection is actually a good sign of healing. So what antibiotics and which cement to use? So we usually use heat stable broad spectrum antibiotics. Powder form is preferable with high local concentration. The preferred antibiotic combination is tobramycin, vacomycin. Maximum you can add is 8 grams. And we prefer pelocos which is highly porous than simplex. And Nowadays, we available is Pelacos G. We add vancomycin 4 grams for 40 grams. So what is the second burning issue was timing of second stage. According to Mescalay, he like, uh, used to do second stage in 4 to 8 weeks. 
the secretion of the inductive molecules by the membrane reaches a peak that of a de declines. Therefore, we prefer doing it in between four to eight weeks. What we do is we prefer in doing this in four to six weeks second stage because we are using antibiotic spacer and the antibiotic evolution is for six weeks. After that, it acts only as a mechanical spacer. So third burning issue was bone graft. Maskele used only cancerous bone graft from the iliac crest and if the volume was insufficient, he used reamer irrigator aspirator that is from the tibia or femur or sometimes add graft expanders and biphasic hydroxy appetite or tricalcium calcium phosphate because they have oxygenic properties. The disadvantage being since large amount of graft is required, there is no structural support because of infection there are large um, high number of interventions about a mean of about 6.2. So we use structural graft along with cancerous graft in other cases, we use from fibula, tricotyl iliac graft, tibial cortex. We have rigid fixation. They decrease the amount of cancerous graft. Graft it occupies space and gives appropriate tension and decrease in graft resorption non-union. So in our our modifications, we have used a two-stage technique. What was small series of cases we have done in upper extremity? We have antibiotic to the cement spacer. We added structural graft in addition to cancerous graft. These are a couple of cases which we have done in our our uh, institute. This is three months post-op, infective non-union of ulna. These centimeter bone graphs, excised, smears inserted. This follow-up x-rays. This is case two, in which po uh, after uh, two months post-surgery, infective non-union, humerus. This is three centimeter bone gap. Antibody semen space inserted. Fibula stud with cancerous bo bone grafting was done. And long fillos plate. These are the sequential x-rays. So in our modification, we have antibody semen spacer. We have used structural graft along with cancerous graft. There was union by incorporating fibula at both ends and there were good results with lower interventions. So take home message is, masculine technique is as actually useful if applied, the principles are applied properly. Various issues which were corrected in our small series, especially for upper extremity, with using antibiotic cement and cancerous bone graft, which has led to fewer intervention, early union and added financial advantage. I thank you all for your patient listening. Any questions? Yes. Does the suturing of the membrane or non suturing of the membrane yeah. affect the uh, union line? Yes. The membrane with Mescalay described is incising the membrane, remove the, uh, remove the spacer, put the graft, and suture the membrane lightly, but not very tight. So he has advised that. In our cases, whatever membrane we get, but actually we are, it is like our bone is, because we are doing a stud graft, we are incorporating at both ends. But we have to suture the membrane with very, not very tight sutures. In your cases, you have used stud graft as well as Yes, we are using stud graft along with cancerous graft. Any other questions? Five minutes, talk, sir, two minutes discussions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Surinder Bhava, thank you very much. I call upon the next speaker, uh, Mr. Do sorry, Dr. Harpal Sethi, Sehli, uh, my apologies. A decision to craft after fixation of fractures. Dr. Sehli. Uh, good afternoon. This is the topic which was given to me and I thought over it, what to speak because there's hardly any literature if we search it. One of the articles I found was 1955, one of the first articles on bone grafting. So then I looked back into my practice and tried to see what we have been doing and then looked for the literature to support. So why do we need bone graft? Most commonly nowadays is structural. When you need support, like he said, a strut graft and a cancellous graft, you need to fill in the gaps you need osteoinduction, cancellous graft is added, and you need osteogenesis. A lot of people use cancellous graft or they'll use bone marrow aspirate also for osteogenesis. So fresh fractures, the thing that comes to my mind is the depressed fractures that we elevate, like in proximal tibia or calcaneum fractures. Slowly we are drifting away from the bone grafting even in those. The evidence that's coming in is even if you don't graft, either you use uh, supplements, artificial supplements or colognes, but you don't take out of the patient's body. 
proximal humerus lot of people say that you need a medial support if you cannot reconstruct a medial calcar you need support in the form of a fibula or a tricortical graft so another site which we commonly majority of us use in clinical practice not everyone again there are too many ways to skin the cat some people would agree with me some will not distal femur again the medial side defect lot of controversies whether we should plate or put a strut graft again too many ways to skin the cat so just showing some examples this is a young medical student not from our own hospital uh, presented to me with open fracture head injury and multi trauma patient this is what i was able to do on day 1 debridement and nailing few days down the line she had discharge from the fracture site for which i had to do a redebridement and then put in antibiotic cement beads took out the beads after the infection settled the bio uh, biochemical parameters were normal and it goes on to unite on its own lot of people might debate this needs a bone graft in my view it did not and i was lucky i won't say that it it's because of my smartness or intelligence i have been lucky in this because infection is one scenario we should consider to have a quick healing go ahead and bone graft now this is it a surgeon failure or is it a non union right again do we need a bone graft here how many of you agree on a bone graft here he is a young patient software engineer 24 years old not married as yet yeah so i went ahead corrected the biomechanics no bone graft and fracture goes on to unite he is walking around he can squat on the bed and work on his laptop another one a elderly lady the x ray looks like elderly she is just 45 had fracture neck femur somebody did a bipolar she presents to me 2 years later with a fracture a periprosthetic fracture this kind of osteoporosis people will say on lay graft cancellous graft again i am i am not totally against grafting but i desist from doing grafting i fixed it and it went on to unite and she came back to me with bilateral supracondylar fractures again this is one side i fixed it again on pth therapy because of osteoporosis she has united on this side also now this is a scenario where i would say i this is my failure i should have grafted on first day because here the biology is not uh normal she had a atypical fracture following bisphosphonates and i should have done a bone grafting this is my failure one should not be too over confident another condition in my practice yeah another can i ask you sir khatam kar lo another another is a distal femur if there is a defect and there is a instability supplement and bone graft it is mandatory it's a gospel truth we have seen enough failures and we don't want to see more failures in this so fresh fractures in my practice if it's a gap it's usually a open fracture there i would respect i would focus on the soft tissues and infection and then go ahead with the graft like in the distal femur for fresh fractures combination where open reduction and internal fixation is being done and there is no contact grafting can be considered it's basically for structural support or for defects comminuted fractures as we discussed and basically for non unions acute in my practice has no role thank you thank you dr saili uh we'll take one question from dr tanna okay a lateral right fracture which you showed is not very susceptible to a grafting healing because there is first and foremost you need an additional additional plate over it and the graft which you take autograft itself is also defective defective so i feel you need a bmp if at all you will be using sir first of all my uh, let me admit it was not part of the talk so i haven't desisted it's a wrong fixation that i've done right uh, i would prefer something where there's compression on day 1 i would like to compress this fracture and angle blade plate is the best implant for this not for elindronate fracture you need an intramedullary implant 
plate exactly that the additional plate if it's a nail additional plate and totally in contact so abc alignment biology and contact is must for these fractures thank you dr seli with due respect we have to move on to the next speaker i call upon sunil dr sunil handralmath for his presentation on percutaneous iliosacral screw fixation dr sunil good afternoon respected tanna sir and my dear friends we are talking on percutaneous fixation of sacroiliac joint i am working at uh, dr vaishampa and government medical college solapur uh, so young and berg is classification tiles classification i think everybody is well versed these are the sacral fractures which ala zone foraminal zone and central body fracture where central and longitudinal transverse fractures we are interested in these are the tiles a b and c which stable pelvic ring partial unstable and completely unstable where shearing fractures rotational forces come in uh, come in force and there will be a vertical as well as rotational translation of hemi pelvis so apart from pelvic damage control including the external fixation wrapping pelvis pelvic compression bondage uh, external fixator pelvic c clamp apart from embolization of uh, Uh, pelvic packing and embolization of pelvic vessels uh, we have to deal with the grotesque pelvic injuries in such so what are the indications of percutaneous fixation any unstable anterior ring injury which involves pubic diastasis more than 2 cm 2.5 cm any sacroiliac displacement more than 1 cm and any vertical shear injury more than 0.5 cm need to be fixed so our total 28 patients we managed and uh, evaluating our solapur pelvic score i will tell you what it is modified majid pelvic score we just included what i will tell you let so this is majid score which includes pain work sitting sexual intercourse standing gait and walking what we indicated uh, included is addition of squatting and sitting cross leg for our farming uh, area patients so what you need is a very good anterior posterior radiograph and a 2d and 3d recon images of the pelvis as well as you will need a very good intraoperative assistant of high resolution cm intensifier and what armamentarium you will using a simple drill and a <coughs> long threaded tfn guide wire 1.8 mm and you may need a 6.5 mm cannulated cancellus partially threaded as well as completely threaded uh, including uh, 8 mm as well if the Um, hefty male is there so what you did in uh, lateral radiograph is what the red line indicates slanting line that is what we call as a ilio cortical density line which is formed by the uh, formed by the ileal curve overlap over the anterior sacral promontory this is a where uh, the bone is dense and your lat in lateral view your guide wire sh should be bang on icd line so as you can see and in anterior posterior view as far as possible you maintain the parallelogram of two guide wires to have a, the better fixation so it's surgeon preference whether he is well versed in supine or prone uh, and uh, this should be the table and uh, this should be the uh, c arm which uh, to get a inlet and outlet view even in prone position you will be able to do the same spine position which with the bolsters you do in prone position what you see is Uh, the 30 degree uh, i will explain it in a guide wire in next slide and this is a very narrow, narrow marginal window you get for percutaneous fixation so this is how uh, the this parallel so 30 degree downwards 30 degree downwards and 30 degree cephalocaudal uh, should be your direction of the guide wire so you basically trying to hit the sacral promontory anterior uh, uh, margin anterior one third part of the body of the sacrum s1 and s2 so that uh, should be the your your goal in passing the percutaneous guide wire and while drilling you drill it and then stop and then try to hammer it get the feel of the bone and sound of the sound of the bone that will definitely give you the better idea whether you are in dense bone or not any feeling of the lost way stop it retrieve the guide wire and try it again once again so this is narrow zone safe zone anteriorly guided by the pelvic vessels and posteriorly neural elements so basically you get only 2 cm safe zone where you can pass again the importance of icd line is very important laterally you should be bang on this your guide wire should lie on the id icd line so this is uh, one of the 3d view where you can pass a guide wire downwards as well as towards the leg end of the 30 degree 30 degree 
And here, sacroiliac dissociation, you can pass partially threaded. But in sacral alar fractures or foramenal fractures, pass a completely threaded cancellous screws. Because these are positional screws, you don't want any compression or pinching of the S1, S1 nerve root. So there are advantages of supine and prone as well. Supine is anti simultaneous anti-ring stabilization can be done. Difficulty uh, is uh, passing screw from posterior to anterior. Uh, while fracture displacement of sacral joints may not be reduced. In prone, definitely there is direct reduction of the SI joint, easy positioning of the screws, and uh, bowel gas shadow may not interfere with that. So these are few of the cases where uh, the grotesque spell were bilateral sacral, sacral fractures, acidural fractures, anterior ring injury, we fixed, patient is able to squat and sit toss like. Almost done 15 years back. This is uh, the young, young guy with the ileal fracture, with a sacral fracture and anterior ring injury, which we fixed, able to fix percutaneously posteriorly. This is another which we done completely anteriorly, percutaneously. Anterior column as well as posterior column has been done percutaneously and the patient is walking very comfortably even if he is admitted, 10th post of day. He can squat and sit, sit cross leg. This was a, one of the other cases where you can see <coughs> This was lumbar pelvic fixation, 22 year old guy who had a transverse fracture of uh, pelvis as well as uh, SI joint, bilateral SI joint uh, uh, fracture, sacral fracture. And that is what we call as a lumbar pelvic fixation. With the help of LR pedicle screws, we got a hold of pelvis and pedicular fixation in lower lumbar region and bilateral percutaneous sacroiliac fractures. On day 7 or 8, he is walking in the ward comfortably. This was another? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So. This was the last where the patient can squat and sit cross leg, every anterior and posterior. So take home message is suit the suitor, supine and prone, well versed. For beginners, practice on 3D model of the pelvis. Plan the fixation prior to night. Mental surgery is very important. Feel and hear the bone. In between uh, drilling, you just hammer, tap the guide wire and feel for the sound and uh, feel of the guide wire. And percutaneous fixation has definitely an advantage. Uh, advantages over open fixation looking at the last 10 or 15 years of the uh, our results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunil. Uh, very interesting. Why are you showing us anterior or posterior when posterior is clearly superior? Yeah, yeah. I still did not get that point. No, no, Any I had. Questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. May I call upon Dr. Satish Kaya to present periprostatic fractures of the proximal femur? Keep some for the day. Hello, everybody. I'm going to speak on periprostatic fractures of the femur. There's a small group which we have studied, which I have done a few cases of it myself. Now, I'm not going to go and uh, tell you about the routine periprostatic fractures. I'm going to only tell you what has changed and what we need to look for now. So, they are complex orthopedic uh, issues and this is what the demand is supposed to grow. Be with increasing uncemented procedures, that is going to be the fallout of the increase in the periprosthetic fracture numbers. They are complex surgeries, you need more than one surgeon to operate uh, together, to put two brains together and uh, we all need some operating experience before we embark on this. Because there is a quite a high morbidity mortality uh, with untrained surgeons. So most of the periprosthetic fractures of the femur around the hip, needless to say, elderly patient. Now the only thing which, uh, uh, which we need to uh, visit is whether we should revise or fix first. Clearly depends upon the stability of the fixation and the cement mantle. Out of all the risk factors, these are the common risk factors. Ladies outnumber men. Uh, the second one is also important, uh, dementia, Parkinsonism, epilepsy. And these... I think we should not lose sight of. They are iatrogenic, which we are responsible for. So be clear when, be sure whether that you're not broaching or you're not notching uh, the stem or you're not inadvertently poking out uh, the remus from the anterior or the posterior cortex or the medial cortex. So this is the objective. Needless to say, I'm not going to read it out. You can clearly see uh, we need proper evaluation. We need to plan our surgery and we need to see what pitfalls which we can come across so that we can avoid them. Uh, for those who have probably not visited uh, periprosthetic fractures, uh, recently this is the classification proximal uh, fractures of the greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, that is AG, type 1. 
the second one is around the uh, stem and the third one uh, is below the tip and uh, sorry the b2 is below the tip and the type b3 is communicated with osteoporosis with multiple fractured fragments and well below the tip is a type c which is uh, between the hip and the knee processes usually so that's what i have just in uh, you know just shown you in the picture so that's the theoretical part of it as a greater trochanter this is how it was fixed type b the more important uh, to realize is that whether we need to look for solidly fixed femoral stem versus a loose stem and we will need to look for loss of bone. So solid or otherwise and loss of bone. Two things to keep in mind. That's a type B that was, that was fixed with the Dalmile cables. That is the outcome. And uh, that is also a type B but it is more on the lines of osteoporosis with unstable. So this was fixed like this well below the stem tip. So this was, uh, this is just an example. I mean, I'll show you the fixation later. This is only meant for completeness. We are primarily focusing on the hip. Uh, most of the cases I've done in Oswestry with Dr. Spencer Jones, Mr. Spencer Jones. And uh, I'm only going to focus on what we found, which is important. So 20 patients, small series, good mix. Females clearly outnumbering males. Elderly patient. And we are seeing more and more of those hemiarthroplasties and revisions coming back now. So trivial injury is the mostly the cause of fall. That's the distribution, proximally more than the distal. Uh, most primary THRs, they end up, or hemiarthroplasties end up with this. This was the, our uh, distribution in the series which we studied. Time since primary surgery can range from anywhere from 18 months to 13 years. Uh, some contentious issues here. I have just uh, heard a presentation where they said we should not bone graft, but I strongly feel about bone grafting, as has been taught to me by my teachers as well. This is the outcomes which, uh, which is assessed as per Beals and Towers criteria. What we need to look for is two measures now. What has changed, as I said? This we are not aware of when we were uh, maybe 10 years ago. So you need to assess diaphyseal cortical bone ratio which is the ratio of A, min A minus B divided by A and the ratio of 0 0.49 is the best indicator of proximal osteoporosis of the femur. So it is a, a measure of the diaphyseal cortical bone thinning. So that's one parameter which you need to assess and document preoperatively. And the second is metaphyseal cortical bone thickening and that's what it is. Now this figure is actually a little bit faulty. So I will come to the next figure. It's actually the outer diameter divided by the inner diameter. And that's the line actually. B divided by D. That's the actually the line. So you need to basically uh, document both the indices. There are several other indices which I will not go into because they are academic interest and we cannot be documenting each and every one. So beware, female gender, uncemented prosthesis, oversized femoral stems, revision surgery and please document preoperatively if there is a, a severe osteoporosis so that we can appropriately explain to the patient. These are a few cases which are around the knee and mostly around the hip which we had fixed and satisfactory outcomes. Now what I want to give you is the take home message as I said. The take home message is good preoperative planning. Keep a range of hardware uh, ready and get good assistance. I can't emphasize, overemphasize the importance of having an assistant surgeon with you who is fairly experienced. Then document those ratios because that is going to help you in medical legal cases. If should something go wrong and there is a high morbidity and some mortality with this, document specific complications likely. There's been a recent uh, article in the papers, you are all aware of it. The Dalmile cable systems is, you have to be very conversant with this. It's extensively used. I would extensively bone graft contrary to what one of the speakers said earlier. Avoid cement at the fracture site. In long stem revisions, bypass it by at least three diameters. Initially it was two, now it's three. Do not notch the distal femoral shaft and be mindful of the CBR. Do not over rim proximally or distally. So know your limits and operate safely. That is my message to you. Thank you.
Thank you. Sir, in every case, I would do bone graft. Yeah. Yes, I would prefer bone graft. I would rather or on the side of bone graft than not. Even if you get a very good quality bone graft. It's, you know that it can have uh, post-fixation osteoporosis locally, especially if you have done an iatrogenic injury. Uh, I call upon the next sp speaker, Dr. Kashyap Ardeshna. Is bridge plate alone sufficient? Need for second plate and graft? Dr. Kashyap. Thank you, Chairman, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, the title is little different. It was some print issues. Is bridge plating alone sufficient in distal femoral fractures or there is a need of second plate or graft? So we know it's a relatively common fracture. It is lots of uh, complication, malunion, nonunion, implant failures. There are a lot of different implants available. But what we are going to speak upon is a bridging plate in distal femoral fracture. The bridging plate, it's not always a locking plate, right? Angle blade plate, DCS, and a different type of uh, locking plates are there. So bridging is a concept rather than a plate. So is bridging plate alone sufficient in distal femoral fracture? That is a question one. So we take a case where there is a community distal femoral fracture and we have fixed with the bridging mod, only the big cortical piece is lagged and then, when, then we see the follow up of this patient. So there was a nice healing with the lateral plate alone. Another case, TK done, 75 year lady, 7 years passed, no knee complaints, uh, extra articular distal femoral fracture. We did a single distal locking plate in a bridging mod. We did a dynamic construct for relative stability principle we applied. And we can see that at 3 month, patient was uh, walking almost full weight bearing. And uh, these were her uh, knee range of movements. And if you look at 11 months, Absolutely anatomically healed, healed well with the callus formation without any deviation in the axis of the joint. So breech plating in distal femoral fracture, there are some advantages. So locking plate has revolutionized the management principles. It works as a bridging internal fixator. It uses the relative stability principle and predictable healing occurs by callus formation. It can be applied biologically with minimal tissue trauma and there is an age of application. But but these pictures are also not uncommon. And for that reason, it is infamously known as a non-union machine. So these are also the problems which happen uh, in some say 15 to 20 percent of cases. So there are disadvantages to plate two. So it's a load bearing device. It's not very good when there is a medial communication. Implant failure is not uncommon. And in one of the study by Ricky, the reoperation rate was touching to 20 percent. And there is a poor screw fixation in osteoporotic bones and there are bigger incisions if you don't uh, do it by MIPO technique. So, is there is a need of something? So, we we'll take a one, one case, a 40 year lady had a polio limb and this fracture was there and it was fixed like this. And then within a short time, say two and a half month, the plate is displaced. So, then we operated this patient again, we did a dual plating, we added a bone graft and this is a six month clinical result of that patient. So what factors we need to be addressing when there is a distal femoral fracture? The factors are mechanical as well as biological. So we look upon the mechanical factors. Mechanical factors doesn't mean always a stronger fixation, always addition of medial plate. So we need to do a proper stress distribution into the bone, into the fracture, into the plate. So that's known as a concept of stress modulation. So with many of these cases, with a single plate, if you do proper stress modulation, then you can very well heal those patients with a single plate. So what we need to do is, we need to use a longer plate, longer working length, the screw density should not be more than 50% and two to three screws only in a proximal fragment. The terminal screw can be placed conventional. And titanium is always better than SS when you are working, speaking about uh, stress modulation. And whenever possible, we should do it minimally invasive. This is again a case, severely comminuted distal femoral fracture. We did a uh, uh, breech plating with a lock plate with the, using the, these principles and we can see there was a nice healing at 9 months. So that's not an out, right? So improving mechanics doesn't always mean putting an additional medial plate. You put the plate properly, you get the good result. Another way of improving mechanics is a medial plate. Here is the case, there was a medial of us, so while operating, we added a medial plate. This also you can do when, when you feel that you need an additional stability. Another thing, when there is a mechanical issues are not there, there are some sometimes there are biological issues, right? 
So this is a very severe osteoporotic lady, 70 year. This patient definitely would have a problem in healing. We did a lateral plate, we did a medial plate, we put a whole of a tricortical iliac crest graft in that. And at four months, there was a nice healing without any disturbance. Another case, grade one, severely commutated, intra-articular, extra-articular, similarly did a bone grafting primarily in a medial plate. At three months, we can see the nice healing is starting. So, what is the literature about this? What is the liter literature support for this medial augmentation and medial support? So, does it help mechanically? Yes. If there is a supplemental fric fracture fixation, then it, it will give you a more stability. Sir, uh, uh, 30 minutes, 30 seconds. Does it harm in biology? No. The vascularity is not much hampered by adding a second plate. Is there evidence clinically? Yes. The double plate has evidence if that has to be kept in surgeon's armamentarium, but it is not always required. Another article saying it is not always required. So only when it is uh, mechanically require, required, then you put it. So when to double plate? Double plate should be considered in a supracondylar bone loss, low transcondylar fractures, periprosthetic distal fractures, non-union after failed fractures, poor bone quality and very comminuted fractures. So my take home is, well done lock bridging plate is sufficient for most of the distal femoral fractures. Augmentation by medial support and or bone grafting is helpful in select cases and a problem fracture should be identified priorly and augmented. Thank you. I, I agree with you, but that's what my total emphasis of uh, technical points during this lecture. The locking plate, failed locking plate, if you assess, most of the failed locking plates are not well done. Not done by the principles which are outlined in many of the literature as well as this talk also. The, if you look at the failed plates, either they are SS plates, longer working length, number of screws there, very rigid fixation or a very wide uh, gap. So most of the locking plate when it is failed, it is failed per operatively. So, uh, when it is not well done. Thank you. <coughs> but the difference between a locking plate and a normal plate is only osteoporosis. Yes. In an adult, in a young bone, even if you put a normal plate with the few screws which you have done it, yeah, it will so work the same sir, thing. I, I, a bit, a bit, I will differ on that. Because when you put a locking plate, the locking plate and the locking bolt construct becomes one. So, it will work as a one total elastic structure. When you put a cortical screw, the cortical screw will fix your bone with the friction. So it will, the first screw only will act, that area only will act as an elastic fixation. While if you put a longer plate, two, three spaced locking screw, the whole construct will be actually having a dynamic uh, modulus. Yes, sir. That, that's always. I think the, in the locking plates, the screws lock to the plate. It's got nothing to do with the bone. So, if there is osteoporosis, you know, that's how the high failure rate. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. I call upon the last speaker to speak on augmentation failures, uh, Dr. Aditya Bardwaj, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I will not be standing long, uh, keeping you away from the lunch. So, to, when I was given this topic, I was, first reaction was a bit augmentation, karna shuru kiya, failures can't say. But uh, to begin with, what is augmentation as told by Dr. Kashyap, it is ad ad uh, addition of any uh, substance to your construct to add uh, more stability to it. It can be biological, synthetic or a metallic. Biological can be cancellous bone graft or a fibular stud graft. Synthetic can be a bone cement or a bone substitute. And metallic can be a plate, nail or a simple encircled wire. And it has clear-cut indications where there's a non-union, you can add a fibula stud graft with a pl longer plate and it unites. In case of a medial combination on a distal femur, you can add a medial plate and which helps you to make a, a stable construct and helps in union. Or in a case where a nail is failing, you add a plate with a bone graft and it goes on to union. But then where it fails, it fails because of two reasons, either it's a patient factors or a surgeon factors. Patient factors are generally the primary indication why in first place you needed a bone, uh, augmentation. So it can be an open fracture which can lead to infection which eventually leads to implant failure or a bone loss or the combination was severe and the augmentation uh, was not enough to support that combination. Osteoporosis or an underlying bone disease like a tumor 
or a surgeon factor where it was not required you could have easily gone away with a single plate but trying to put an extra plate in gave you gave an insult to the biology and the blood supply which eventually led to a non union or a poor technique which is the main cause where an augmentation failed where a surgeon fails to follow the principles of a fracture union so we'll have some cases so this was a case with the fracture neck femur and a shaft which was a pfn was the long pfn was done the neck united but the shaft went into failure so they added a plate to augment thinking it is a hypertrophic non union but the fracture was left in distraction which led to the failure of the augmentation so next time a same construct was used but this time the principles were followed same nail and plate construct but uh, edges were freshened bone more bone graft and a thicker nail and it is uniting and the patient is full weight bearing so it is the principles that you have to follow and not the augmentation what you have to focus on another case of tumor a fibrous dysplasia a primary surgeon did everything nail put a cement in and a plate also to augment it failed it failed because the whole segment of fibrous dysplasia was not resected it was not completely resected they resected it completely with fixed it with the nail and used that cement spacer for a maskle and next time removed the spacer put bone graft and augmented with the plate went into went, uh, went in for union another case an open fracture a distal femur it was debrided put in an external fixator and then replaced with a plate and a uh, cement a month later cement was re removed and allograft with the fibula was put in but it didn't unite maybe the problem was with the stability it needed more stiffer or a stable construct one and a half years later still ct showed no union this time a plate was added with the bone graft which went on to unite so here again the principle was it needed to be more stable construct and that is why a fibular graft failed a case of distal femur again but this time the plate worked well the last time so the surgeon added a plate primarily with the bone graft but many principles were not there the length of the plate wasn't there the proximal fixation wasn't adequate so this also failed so in every case wherever augmentation is failing it is the principles of fracture fixation which are not followed properly and the surgeon is uh, failing because of the principle not being followed this was reamed bone grafted and went on to unite this was an again open fracture so last time there was just a fibula was added then a plate was added so the, and then the nail was done so this time the surgeon was it had nailed it plated it and grafted it and didn't unite still because the reduction wasn't good and the length of the nail was short so again the failure to apply the principles it failed again and coming back fixing it with a dc uh, dynamic and dialer screw but fixing it nicely and following the principle it united so the take home message is augmentation is useful if rightly used and properly used uh, with all the principles of fracture union it is not a replacement to good reduction not uh, if you fail to treat the underlying cause for which you had augmented it and the principles of fracture fixation alignment stability and the length and principles of non union taking out the interposition uh, soft tissue reaming of the medullary opening the medullary canals freshening of the bone edges fixing uh, bone grafting and then giving a stable fixation is what is going to get you union and not just the augmentation thank you thank you one question